No mai haere mai. Welcome to this module from the New Zealand Dementia Foundation's Dementia Stars Education Series. Dementia Stars is a series of eight modules covering some of the most common topics that caregivers work with every day when supporting people living with dementia. You are an extremely important part of the network of people who work in dementia care and we hope you find this course very helpful for your work. Continence is a sensitive issue for everyone and staying continent for as long as possible in our lives is something that we would all want. Continence is seen as a particular issue in dementia, but many people living with dementia may be able to maintain continence and dignity for longer with your help. Tēnā koutou, e tipu aki ao ki murahiku, ko G. te whānau, ko Susan toko ingoa, ko tēnē taku mihi ngā tanga te whenua o te rohi nei. Ka nui te mihi ki a koutou, nō reira, I'm Susan G, and I'm a dementia researcher and educator. I'm also the liaison officer for the New Zealand Dementia Foundation. Today we're going to be talking about supporting people living with dementia to stay continent. Incontinence, particularly urinary incontinence, is very common as dementia progresses. What do we mean by urinary incontinence? We're thinking about situations when a person releases urine or faeces without meaning to, or when they urinate or defecate in a way that's not socially acceptable. Once upon a time, we probably tended to accept any continence difficulties as just part of the dementia illness. Oh well, they're incontinent, we manage that with incontinence products. But now, we realise that there's a lot of problem solving that we can do to help promote continence for many people. Today we're going to look at three key messages to help to promote continence. The person comes first, understand the steps and problem solve. Our first key message is that the person comes first. They always do, in every situation when we're providing support. But toileting issues can be especially challenging to relationships. One of the ways that we can help put the person first is to think about the situation from their perspective. To get us started, I'm going to ask you to think about the perspective of a person experiencing continence issues. What would you like your care to be like? So imagine that you've been diagnosed with a rapidly progressive younger onset dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Your family says your personality's changed. You've developed memory problems and also, to your surprise, continence problems. For the first time since you were a toddler, you can't manage to stay continent and you're having to get help. How might it feel to have continence issues in your life? A range of quite strong emotions may come up for you like embarrassment, shame, distress, even disgust. You might also feel frustration about the inconvenience and lack of control. You might want to hide it from people to deal with it yourself. You might become very aware of your need for privacy. And we might also have some positive things like focusing on coping mechanisms, trying to use humour or acceptance. Putting ourselves into this situation can help us to make sense of some of the responses we might encounter when we're offering assistance for continence and incontinence. For example, resisting care, hiding soiled pads to try to conceal incontinence, low mood and irritability. When we think about it, we might respond to the situation in a similar way. We all want to be offering continence support that provides dignity and care. What this looks like may be different for different people. It's always about getting to know the person. When we think about ourselves in this situation, we can see why it's so important that we do all that we can to help promote continence. Going to the toilet is such a private part of our lives. If problems do occur, we need to be very sensitive and understanding towards the person to help maintain their dignity. We're always getting to know the person, what's important to them, 
what they like and don't like, what their strengths are. We need to be committed to problem solving, possible barriers to help promote continence. Our next key to doing this is to consider possible causes of the problem and how they impact on the steps of going to the toilet. Sometimes the cause of continence is a change in the body's systems. Other times, things outside the urinary and bowel system are the main cause of the continence problems, or they're making the continence problems worse. Here are two things to consider. Firstly, sometimes incontinence has a treatable cause. It's always a good idea to encourage the person to seek medical advice. Some common causes that a medical professional may be able to help with include urinary tract infections, constipation, prostate problems, and the side effects of medication. Secondly, we can often help continence. Continence isn't an all or nothing. Just because someone has continence problems doesn't mean that all hope is lost. Some people who have advanced dementia may lose complete control of their bladder or bowels. But this is far from the only reason that people living with dementia experience problems relating to the toilet. There are four common problems around urinary continence that we may often encounter in the people that we support. Firstly, some people have urge incontinence, which is caused by an overactive bladder. They have sudden bladder spasms that mean that they've got to go now. Some people, particularly women, develop stress incontinence. They may experience leakage when their tummy muscles get a workout. Things like sneezing, coughing or lifting. Thirdly, some people have overflow incontinence and they may leak urine. Fourthly, some people have functional incontinence. So this is where the cognitive or physical impairments make it difficult to complete some of the steps of going to the toilet on time. This can be common as dementia progresses. I'm going to ask something kind of strange, but important. I want you to imagine that you need to go to the loo. Between you sitting here right now listening to this video and you returning to your seat, what's involved? What are the steps? Although we hardly even think about it, there's actually lots involved. The first thing is that you have to be able to notice that you need to go to the toilet. You have to have the motivation to get up and go to the toilet. You might need to ask for assistance if it's required. You need to be able to control the urge until you get there. You need to remember where the toilet is and be able to find it. You actually need to recognize the toilet itself. You have to be able to get your clothes ready. You have to sit or stand, pee, wipe, dispose of the paper, stand up, flush, rearrange your clothes, clean up any small messes, leave the bathroom, find your way back, and that's not even remembering to wash your hands. You've got steps like turning on the tap, washing your hands, using the soap, turning off the tap, drying your hands. So here's the point. That's a lot of skills and steps involved in going to the toilet. No wonder it can be challenging. Thinking about toileting this way can help us to see the person's strengths as well as the possible barriers. We can start by thinking about the steps that they can do. We use that as our base and we make sure that we enable the person to keep doing these steps without us taking over. Then we look at any of the steps that might be an issue and how we can problem solve to help promote continence for that individual. Let's see what problem solving continence might look like by working through three case studies. For our first case study, let's meet Mr. Zwart. Mr. Zwart's story focuses on get up and go and the power of prompting. Pieta Zwart is a physically fit and healthy 58 year old with frontal temporal dementia. Mr. Zwart had to give up his job as his dementia progressed. He's also giving up his hobbies of golf and gardening. He can't be bothered to clean his teeth or have a shower. And he doesn't seem to be interested in what's going on with the family or talking with people. 
He can certainly get up and go to the toilet when we prompt him, but he doesn't do it on his own, which means that he sometimes wets himself. Mr Zwart doesn't show low mood or concern about these changes. His wife jokes that he's just got lazy. The GP says that while these changes do look a lot like depression, Mr Zwart doesn't show any of the signs of sadness or negative thinking that we might expect. The GP says that many people living with dementia, especially frontal lobe dementia, experience something called apathy syndrome. Lara Hitchcock is going to tell us about what this means. Now a lot of people ask me, what is apathy? And this is where you don't have the motivation to do the things that you love and that give you joy and passion. And especially in the very early stages, a lot of people say to me, this is not the person, they are lazy now. And so I have to explain what apathy is. Sometimes we say that it's a, your starter motor isn't working so well. So it's not, we all have a lack of motivation to do things that we don't particularly want to do. There are times when I really, really don't want to empty the dishwasher and I don't have the energy and the motivation to do it. But with apathy, it's not having the motivation to do the things that you love, things that you've always been able to do really, really easily. And it can impact the things that you do, the things that you enjoy. It can impact your day-to-day -day tasks and daily living tasks. It can also affect how you are socially and how you communicate. So this can cause a lot of people a lot of distress. And so with apathy, especially in some of the later stages, this can impact personal cares and day-to-day -day tasks, things like continence. The reason people have apathy syndrome in dementia is due to changes in the brain. So with certain types of dementia, like frontal temporal dementia, this impacts the frontal lobes of the brain. And the frontal lobes of the brain are really, really important for planning and sequencing and for your starter motor. So this means that we have problems with our internal cues to actually get started. But once those things start, then we are able to use external cues. For some people, they are able to identify external cues and that can be through signage, but also through people who are there to support them. So imagine you're sitting on the sofa and you need to go to the toilet. Your starter motor gives you the motivation to get up and to go to the toilet. If you're living with dementia and you have apathy syndrome, you haven't got that starter motor. So you have the function to be able to identify that you need to use the toilet, but you haven't got the motivation to be able to get up and go. And this is when people need that additional help and support. Coming back to the case study again, if we think about strengths, Mr. Zwart has retained most of the skills involved in toileting. The step that's difficult for him is that early one of responding to the need to go to the toilet. And that's because of the apathy syndrome. It's like his starter motor's broken, so he can't get the process started himself. But we can help with that. Prompting toileting can be really helpful to promote continence for many people living with dementia. It can help to overcome problems with memory and apathy. So we set out to find if Mr. Swart has a predictable routine of when he wets his pad or needs to go to the toilet. We use this to know when to prompt. A person may have had a lifetime routine and sticking to the old routine may work particularly well. For example, we discover that Mr. Zwart usually needs to go to the toilet about half an hour after breakfast. Now we give the prompt about 20 minutes after breakfast by asking Mr. Zwart if he needs to go to the toilet. This works really well 
as Mr. Zwartz is able to recognise that he does need to go to the toilet, and with this assistance, he maintains his continence. If we couldn't find his personal routine, we could try providing prompts about every two hours during the day and before and after meals. Now for some people who've spent many decades knowing when they have to go to the toilet, having someone prompt them can seem like a bit of nonsense or quite insulting. Sometimes it can help to think about what makes sense for that person. For one person, washing their hands before food makes sense to them and we're paired going to the toilet along with that. Another person might click with going for an after lunch walk and so it makes sense to them to go to the toilet before they go for their walk. When Mr Zwartz is at the toilet, we provide him with plenty of time. We don't rush him. It may take a little time to get started. Sometimes the sound of running water can help. We also give him as much privacy as possible. If it's appropriate, we might walk away and come back in a few minutes or stand just outside the door. We encourage him to be as independent as possible. We could provide simple step-by-step -step instructions if he needed them. We think about dignity and care and we're really careful to avoid making any frustrated or belittling comments. For our second case study, meet Mrs Black. Mrs Black's story helps us to think about making it in time. Mrs Margaret Black is a widow with three adult daughters. She was a stay-at-home wife and mother and she likes herself and her surroundings to look tidy and nice. Mrs Black has moderately severe vascular dementia and arthritis. She has some difficulty communicating with words. She uses a walker and requires assistance for sit-to-stand transfers. Mrs Black has urge incontinence and she finds her urinary incontinence accidents really distressing. Sometimes Mrs Black becomes very agitated about needing to go shopping, especially after morning and afternoon tea. She's not settled by assurances that her daughter comes on Tuesdays to take her shopping. If we think about strengths again, Mrs Black wants to stay continent and she's able to tell the difference between being wet and being dry. That's definitely a useful starting place. We can see a number of challenges, such as Mrs Black's verbal communication, her impaired mobility and physical abilities due to her arthritis, and her urge incontinence. When we look more closely, we can see that this means that the steps that are difficult for Mrs Black are asking for assistance, holding on until it's appropriate to go, getting to and from the bathroom, and getting clothes arranged to use the toilet properly. Here's three things that we can try. Know the signs. Someone living with dementia may be reluctant to ask for assistance, or like Mrs Black, they may be struggling with words. We can look out for signs and signals and get to know the ways that a person shows that they need to go to the toilet. For one person, it might be pulling at their clothes. For another, it might be getting restless. As Mrs Black's care worker, we talked to one of her daughters. Now, it turns out that Mrs Black used to call going to the toilet, I need to spend a penny. Now that Mrs Black has some difficulty with her words, this has become, I need to go shopping. No wonder she didn't want to wait until Tuesday. Now that we know that asking to go shopping is a sign that Mrs Black wants to go to the toilet, we also notice that pulling her trousers or her skirt up to her knees is another sign. We can make sure that we assist Mrs Black to the toilet straight after morning and afternoon tea to help prevent the need becoming urgent. We can keep an eye out for signs that Mrs Black is pulling on her clothes or asking to go shopping and help her promptly. How else might we help Mrs Black? Reduce the urge. We could think about 
what Mrs Black is having to drink at morning and afternoon tea. Caffeinated drinks, fizzy drinks and artificial sweeteners can irritate the bladder and make urge incontinence worse. So after some discussions, we find that we can swap Mrs Black's coffee for decaffeinated coffee, still in the same mug and made just the way she likes it. Mrs Black enjoys her decaffeinated coffee just as much, but the change seems to be helping with her urge incontinence. We also check to see if Mrs Black is getting enough fluids. Being dehydrated can actually make urge incontinence worse, as the concentrated urine can irritate the bladder. We come up with some strategies to help Mrs Black keep her fluids up, including providing more foods that help to hydrate, like juicy fruit, soup or instant puddings, and we help her to overcome her hesitance to drink. We can also help people make it in time by making it easy. We check to see if there are parts of the toileting that are confusing or difficult. Remember how many tasks there were involved in toileting. Knowing just which parts of toileting are causing the difficulty helps us then to encourage the person to do what they can and we only help as required. That makes it more likely that we can help the person to have as much privacy and independence as possible. Sometimes a simple clear prompt about the next step will help. Sometimes we can make the tricky part easier with equipment or adaptations. Sometimes we can provide assistance with the tricky part. For Mrs Black, it turns out that getting her clothes undone in time was a problem. Some clothes are an absolute pain to get out of at the best of times and desperately needing to go to the toilet while having arthritic fingers is definitely not one of the best times. Swapping clothes with zips and buttons for elastic or velcro can be a time saver that helps to prevent accidents. Mrs Black's daughter helped find some elasticated pants to replace her button up ones still in her favourite pink colour. We also got some professional advice about Mrs Black's mobility issues. We worked out that the toilet was too low for her to get up easily. A raised toilet seat was really helpful. In some situations, a commode chair or a urine bottle for men may work when the toilet's too far away to get to in time, for example at night. So we tried a number of things and we managed to reduce the frequency of accidents for Mrs Black. That means that Mrs Black didn't have the distress of feeling trapped when she couldn't get to the toilet without assistance. Mrs Black still wears incontinence products to help her feel safe in case of accidents, but these are usually dry. If an accident does occur, we don't make a fuss and we reassure her after changing that she's still looking very nice and smart. Our third case study is about Mr Pungo, who likes to be known as Jack. Jack's story focuses on knowing where to go. So Jack is 74 years old. He's an ex-lorry driver with a great sense of humour. From early on in his dementia, he's had visual and spatial problems, as well as memory problems. These have progressed. Jack has started to go to the toilet in inappropriate places like the hallway and the pot plant in the bathroom. While Jack may have a wicked sense of humour, these problems related to going to the toilet are due to the changes in his brain. He's not joking around. If we think about strengths, Jack's actually trying to do the right thing and he's almost making it but his brain changes are getting in the way of the steps of finding the toilet and recognising the toilet. Jack's growing problems with memory and spatial skills mean that he's now having trouble finding the toilet, so he ends up going in the hallway. Even though Jack's eyes are still working fine, the parts of his brain that process what he's seeing aren't working properly. When he gets to the bathroom, he's having trouble recognising where the toilet is. We want to think about 
how we can make it easier for Jack to find the bathroom and recognise the toilet. There are a couple of things that could help here. One is signage. We want a sign that has good contrast so it's easy to see. Black on a coloured background. We also want to use a picture and words that Jack recognises. Usually a picture of an actual toilet is going to work better than a symbol that Jack has to interpret. I once went to a restaurant that had Neptune or Mermaid on the toilet doors. That's not helpful. If Jack's still able to recognise words, we want to use a label with whatever word Jack uses, whether that's Dunny or Lou or toilet. The second thing that's going to help here is contrast. If the bathroom has a white floor and white walls, a white toilet, no wonder a nice bright pot plant is what caught Jack's attention. We could try a coloured seat to help make the toilet the focus of attention. And we could use a coloured cleaner box to tint the water. This might help, or it might be confusing. Jack might never have had a coloured toilet seat. We'd need to try it and see. Sometimes that white hand basin can be a trick for gentlemen too, as it can be interpreted as a urinal. We could see why. We could try keeping a face cloth in there to see if that helps signals that it's a hand basin, while at the same time making the toilet obvious with that coloured seat. If that doesn't work, we might just have to accept that a hand basin can actually make a pretty good urinal if we clean up and sanitise carefully. The mirror above the sink could also be confusing for someone who doesn't recognise their own reflection. They might think that the toilet's already occupied or that someone's trying to watch them. So we might need to cover the mirror. There are other things that we could try too, like brighter lighting or keeping the door ajar when the toilet's unoccupied so that Jack can see the toilet or assisting Jack to the toilet. We don't make a fuss or tell Jack off for his use of different areas to go to the toilet. We recognise it's a genuine mistake. We try lots of things. We take the pot plant away from the bathroom. We put in a black toilet seat and we attach a cleaner to tint the water blue. We stick a sign with a picture of a toilet and the word Dunny on the door and another one with an arrow in the corridor. We show Jack these cues and we have a few laughs and we drop reminders of these cues into the conversation several times when we're going past or we're using the bathroom, like asking Jack if he likes the black dunny seat. Jack responds well to the new signage and the coloured toilet seat and now he nearly always uses the toilet. So in summary, we're taking a very positive approach to promoting continence. Remembering that the person comes first, considering the steps of toileting and the person's strengths and difficulties, and proactively problem solving. With this approach, we can often make a difference and help people to maintain comfort, dignity and continence. It is a process of trial and error though, and accidents will still happen. It doesn't mean that you've failed or that they've failed. We're going to try and overcome any embarrassment or upset that they may feel and we're all going to keep calm and keep promoting continence. It's been my absolute pleasure to share this topic with you. Ngā mihi nui. If you have time, please do consider checking out the other topics in the Dementia Stars series. We hope you have found this Dementia Stars course valuable. We really appreciate the time you have taken to allow us to share some new ideas and fresh perspectives on this important topic with you. We hope you will return to your work with people living with dementia with renewed enthusiasm. It's such an important job and you are a very precious part of the dementia family. The New Zealand Dementia Foundation would like to thank CHT Healthcare Trust for their generous support of this project. 
If you would like to learn more about the New Zealand Dementia Foundation's work, check out their website and join the community. This module is one of a series of Dementia Stars courses. You can find out more about the other topics from your workplace educator or on the New Zealand Dementia Foundation's website. Nā mihi mai oha. Thank you so much for your commitment to people living with dementia.